if we lived in a Huda nation and what that would look like, what that would feel like, what that would be like. And just using the values that were taught in Huda, I thought that if there was any sort of product that I'd like to put out into the world, it would be with those values in mind. As artists, we just kind of hope that people might uh, like what we do, and the response was even better than I had ever, ever expected. summer of 2004, it was one of the most meaningful and magical summers we've ever had at La Mama Umbria, which is the artistic residency in Italy. There are certain people that you encounter who touch you and change you in a way that impacts the rest of your life. One of the amazing things about that summer is that we were in the presence of three of those people. Robert Casimero, Roberta Uno, and Kale Wolfer. Three people whose intelligence, artistry, openness, humor, and grace influenced us far more than we could ever have imagined. They were in residence at La Mama, developing Island, and that was the first time that Ellen Stewart and Robert Casimero met. We remember eating, and talking about fabulous Italian food together. And we remember laughing so hard around the table and in the car rides going to visit a monastery that was um, uh, uh, the monastery of St. Francis. And then we went also to this lovely little mountain village. The whole time, we continue to laugh. We remember conversations that stayed with us for a long time. We felt so lucky. It was right before Mia and I were married, and, um, and it, it was such a, a special and meaningful experience to be moved in, in, in such a way together. And I think that it deeply impacted our relationship and how our relationship developed. Maybe it was what sealed the deal. Yeah. <laughs> oh. <laughs> 
That summer, we were introduced to hula. And watching Keo dance, we were transported. His great spirit, his talent, and ultimately his love opened up a whole <coughs> world to us. It was a world where we felt the power of art to transform. That summer changed us forever. It's still very hard to believe <coughs> what has happened. And at the same time, we feel so blessed to have shared that magical time. Thank you, Robert. Thank you, Roberta. And thank you, Keo. We feel you here tonight on this Valentine's Day in the Ellen Stewart Theater. <laughs> Joseph Wolford, Kona Inoe. Oh, no, no, Kahalame, Kalehua. He, he, Halelehua, no, Yamakano. Oh, Kahui, no, Ine.
welcome you to this uh, human mist of aloha, of friends, New York friends, theater friends, hula friends, friends, and any family here. Uh, and I simply offer to you just as a shark's tail can suddenly move and change direction. So has tail suddenly move and change direction. And just as the shark seeks out the sacred flame at the bottom of the sea, so has Kale continue his search for the sacred flame in the heavens and pursues that burning passion that inspires him still. Enjoy. Robert Catamaro once said, we all can be made better for daring to dance. And I was a student briefly in Keo's New York Kane Hula class, albeit a remedial Hula student who never graduated yet Hula basis. <laughs> On the other hand, watching Keo dance brought joy. There was bravery, courage, self-belief, and beauty in his movement. And tonight it's my honor to perform a favorite song of Keo's, uh, one of Hawaii's most blessed and beloved songs, Kanaka Laihai.
by Judah uh, Kohlhaasen. Aloha. My name is Scott Kutsura. I knew Kale from way back when he was still calling himself Joey. Right out of high school, we were introduced by our voice coach and teacher, Eunice DiMello in Manoa Valley. Our first encounter was in choir practice as Joey and I sang for St. Clement's Church across the street from Ponoho Schools. From that day on, Joey and I became best of friends, literally. If I wasn't found hanging out at his apartment in Kalihi, or he hanging out at mine at the Holly Kaheka building, the all in one center, they were both found cruising together all over the island somewhere. Joey and I were, were most connected through our love for music of all types. In those days, I remember Joey fascinating adoration for Michael Jackson. We loved tearing up the dance floors in the most pulsating nightclubs in Honolulu. We loved going to concerts. One of our favorite, uh, one of our favorites was waving hello to Whitney Houston from the front row at the MPC Arena. That was awesome. My most cherished moment back in Hawaii with Joey was laying in the sand in the wee hours of the morning, like 3 a.m. on a work night, staring at the bright hoku, the bright stars, in the vast Hawaiian sky, sharing our deepest thoughts about our hopes and dreams and passions of what we wanted to be when we grew up and became professional. We'd ask each other questions like, what would you name your first album when you have one? Or, what is the title of your first number one song? I can still vividly remember Joey, Joey's answer to that question. He said, Scott, my first number one song will be titled, We Gotta Start Somewhere. Right? That's so Joey. As the years rolled by, Joey moved to LA and soon established himself as K.O. Wolford, the singer and actor. While I moved to New York City to pursue my music career and to become housemates with an R&B singer and longtime family friend named Evelyn Champagne King. Okay, let's fast forward. Before I knew it, K.O. moved to New York City. It felt like it became full circle for the both of us. In 2005, Kale asked me to compose and perform a song for a Broadway play that he was involved in, Sonnets for an Old Century. My song would appear on the CD soundtrack. I said to Kale, sure I'll do it, but only if you sing the background vocals and arrange it too. As only Kale would enthusiastically reply, shoot, T, let's do it. <laughs> you will hear Kale's sweet voice in the background when I sing this song. Ironically, this play was comprised of multiple short skits each of them with one repetitive theme, death. Each story would ask, what would someone say in the splinter of a moment before they were silenced forever by their physical death? Kao chose for me the story about a boy who loses his father. I named this song, In My Heart I Know, from the boy's perspective. This very special song was the only professional collaboration that Kao and I have ever worked on in our careers. It kind of trips me out today to think that I'm singing this for Kao like it was prophecy or something. Right now, even more than the professional singer, the dancer, the writer, the director, and even the teacher, I am most missing my one and only go-to person, that one and only human being who deeply understood my life here in the Big Apple, uh, firsthand as a simple local boy from Daina too. Kale too understood the city mentality, the quick pace, the change of drastic northeast weather, so unlike Hawaii, even sometimes the requirement of having to be that brutally honest New Yorker. Right. Kale and I shared that deep understanding of how much we both had to stretch. Stretching from one side of the world to the other, stretching from the most isolated planet on our place on our planet to the empire state of our country. We stretched without losing or compromising our aloha spirit, our island customs and all that goes with it. As Kale would always remind me, no matter if you want pop star singer Scott, no matter what kind of style the artist, uh, you either get true aloha or you know more. True. Aloha is where we were always the same. And together, Kale and I wholeheartedly agreed how we both found plenty of aloha spirit here in the Big Apple and how we were so blessed through beautiful people like you that are here with us tonight. So give yourself a round of applause, please, for being here. Mahalo nui loa to each and every one of you, to all of you who are watching the live stream from around the world, and a big mahalo to everyone who put this beautiful event together, and especially to you, Roberto Uno. Big round of applause for Roberto Uno. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
Hello, 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 and to Patty Danko for uh, connecting me to all of this. Thank you, Patty. I love you. So I sing this for you, Keo Bailani, because in my heart I know. Uh, Aloha Bahia Boy, I love you. Now before I say it over here, oh, I am I am just so honored, so honored uh, to to be able to be asked by a very special uh, friend of mine. Her name is Tracy, and on behalf of Tracy, who is just one of the most important individuals to Ko's life, both professionally and personally in his lifetime. She asked me to read this message to you for her since she couldn't be here. And on behalf of uh, Tracy and Robert Cosimero and uh, all of the Ohana, Racine, and 
the family and father's wife and everybody that I just got to see it, uh, in Hawaiian Memorial just the other week. So they said that their spirit is here with us and uh, this is Tracy's message. So thank you, Tracy, if you're watching right now. Aloha all, my name is Tracy LaRuya. I am a longtime friend of Kale's, as well as his publicist bodyguard. I only have joke about the bodyguard part because that's what we were. Guy Hess, my business partner, and I were bodyguards. Our job was to protect our friend, his work, his brand, and now his legacy. I wanted to share a little bit of Kale and his film life. For many who might not know, Kale's film, The Hamana, is the most successful independent film to come out of Hawaii. It is the only film that has ever sold out the Hawaii. All right, thank you for that. What a good film, right? I watched it like about 25 times already, and I got three DVDs as I burn them out. So uh, I really do. Um, it is the only film that has ever sold out uh, the Hawaii International Film Festival, and the only film to have ever sold out the historic Hawaii Theater. Wow. It is still being viewed around the world thanks to Hawaiian Airlines in-flight movies, as well as being shown in schools, halals, and other organizations worldwide. His legacy will live on not only in his community, but also globally. While a life in film was important to Keo, even more important was the sharing of his Hawaiian culture, and especially hula. I was one of three guests invited by Keo to witness his uniki ceremony, a Hawaiian graduation ceremony for hula, on Kauai at a sacred spot called Ipuha'a. A uniki ceremony consists of months of rigorous tests of the mind, body, soul, and hula. He passed them all, of course. When he was graduated after his final hula dance, the slight smile on his face said it all. I have never seen Keo cry. He shed tears of joys while he received thunderous applause by his closest friends and halau ohana, his family. What an accomplishment in life. In closing, I want to share that the Uluho Festival that Keo and I co-founded in 2015 will now be changed and turned into the Uluho Foundation. Its purpose is to continue new growth, which is what Uluho means, through food, film, and education, and to perpetuate the spirit of his work. We hope to execute a kickoff event in December of 2017 at the Honolulu Museum of Arts Doris Duke Theater. Mahalo for letting me be a part of this special day, a day to honor our heart. Keo Mailani. Aloha and malama kono, Tracy. Thank you. great gift of working with, with our students and our community um, to bring great brightness and joy and intentionality um, really to make the most of those, all those special moments that we have together. And he would teach our hula mula class and um, always bring together and create such a warm feeling amongst all the people who were blessed to be with him. Um, we had a wonderful three years together in New York teaching, and 
are so grateful for his great creativity that he brought to not only our community, but also in his um, artistic work in Hula, but also in his Iman, and later on to share his, his personal journey, um, not only in his theatrical work, but also in his High Mother film um, to really capture the great spirit um, that he gave to all of us. Um, he'll be deeply missed, um, but we are no way we can move forward knowing that we have so much that we've learned from him to remember and to really cherish every moment that we have and uh, do the best we can to do the good things in our lives. Um, to all of you, I extend my warm aloha uh, as we celebrate this time thinking of the life of Kale Wolfer and positive vibrations as we would always say. Aloha.
that was dancing next to him for that first time was one of my happiest moments in my hula life. Even when he left New York, he went to LA, he would come and visit, and he would visit our class, and he would really share his mana'o, his aloha, he would go over the basics, he would conduct workshops, and he created these hula choreographies as our hula exercise to work on our ka'o, to work on our knees, and to move fluidly through our steps. And he's gonna, so miss me and we love him. But in this hula that he choreographed, the water is wide. He gave us wings to soar and we see him in this hula.
feel him here. And uh, in thinking about um, the time that I knew him and worked uh, with so many here on, on Island, and all that that piece meant, the island and the island, and being rooted and grounded. And I looked at the script, the final part of that script, and it's so powerful, and it's so powerful for today and for the future. And that's what art is really about. It's about um, helping us see how we live not only uh, not only in the present, but into the future. So bear with me. I wanted to read the final part of I Land, um, which I think the poetry speaks so loudly and clearly to the moment we're in. If we lived in a hula nation, extinct birds would still sing and people would pray before cutting down a tree. If we lived in a Huma nation, no one would go hungry, and no one would be on a diet. <laughs> if we lived in a Hula nation, big women would be on the cover of all magazines. <laughs> if we lived in a Hula nation, Starbucks would serve others. If we lived in a Hula Nation, violence in movies would be triple X rated, and sex would be celebrated. <laughs> if we lived in a Hula Nation, men would, wouldn't be embarrassed to wear skirts. If we lived in a Hula Nation, every child would have parents. Under the Hula is the sun, the moon, and the stars, legends and thousands of years of genealogy. Under those are volcanoes and oceans. Under the volcanoes and oceans are mountains and valleys. Full of Takake, Pua Keni Keni, Palapalai, and Lawate. Under those are kings and queens and poetry celebrating them and all the things above them. Under those are a history of a people and my kumi. Under my kumi is me. That was Rachel Cooper with Asian Society. I'm Ralph Pena with my theater company. We co-produced Island uh, with Kao. Um, and uh, that was done as a culture project. And the set looked very much like this. It was a circle and there was a wave that uh, Clint Ramos designed, who's now a Tony Award winner set designer, Clint. Uh, but Roberta, Roberta and, and Kao were very much um, the driving energy behind this thing that, that, uh, that we knew we wanted to do uh, because it's so rarely ever done. And what I'm going to read here is the note that Roberta and Kao wrote in the program of Island. Uh, we met on one island, Manhattan, and discovered we were both born on another, Oahu. Roberta was a haumana in a class in New York City where Kao was assisting hula instruction with Michelle Akina. We discovered that we shared backgrounds in theater. Then, as Hawaii people do, we got together to talk story. And boy, did they talk, because that's when they came to me and they said, we got to do the play. <laughs> even, though one of them, uh, even, one of, even though one of us has been raised in Hawaii and the other in California, our stories and experience intersected. We both found that landing in New York, possibly the most culturally diverse city in the world, our Asian Pacific culture so prevalent elsewhere, was surprisingly unknown. We both had experienced comments, not just from the Howie, but from other people of color, or even Asians, about being from Hawaii or dancing hula. How exotic. 
What an unusual hobby. <laughs> Why are you so interested in a hybrid culture? Laughter, as in, that's really kitsch. Making this piece was a way of thinking about landing in different locations and having the capacity to embody several cultural experiences simultaneously. From the beginning, we didn't want Island to be a tourist guide to Hula, nor to claim there is one Hawaiian identity. We wanted to reach beneath the surface without completely revealing the kaona, the multiple, hidden, or deep meanings underneath. That's from Keo and Roberta. And we love them, and we miss them, and thank you. Hi, I'm Christabel. I went on tour with Keo and David Shelley, who was our technical director, back in 2007. We started off uh, for a whole month uh, in the islands in Hawaii, and, and before that, we were in Houston. Uh, but we played also really large theaters all over the country, but it was in the small community centers, the tiny places. It was in the islands, in places like the community center in Hana, in Molokai, uh, little young teenage local boys, they were the ones that were really transformed by meeting Kale and seeing his performances. It was masculinity and vulnerability that they'd never seen before. One of the local boys on Molokai, we asked him, Kale asked him, well, what do you want to be when you grow up? And he said, well, I either want to be a mixed martial artist or a hula dancer, Captain <laughs> Kale. Uh, we also played in Montana in a mental hospital for uh, children who were incarcerated. And they didn't know when they'd probably be getting out. Uh, they were also released from their rooms for the first time all day to see Ko do a 30-minute version of the show. And Ko chanted uh, the Ole Aloha. And he said, this is my gift for me to you. And one of the kids there actually was Hapa and said, I know how to say I'm pal but I'm always hungry, you know what I mean? And Keo was just amazing with these kids. We played in New Orleans just a couple of years after Hurricane Katrina and rode around on motorcycles, and Keo would every once in a while get off and do some chanting or dance. In Manila, they kept mistaking him for a movie star, and we told him, it's no mistake. <laughs> <laughs> it's often lonely on the road when you're, especially in a one-man show, he was at a crossroads in his life, vulnerable and figuring out which way to go. Um, on the way to Molokai, I remember there was a tiny plane with a kickstand. It was nerve wracking. Um, Keo had to be convinced to get on the plane. Um, I found out later, or today, that Dave Shelley lied about his weight. He figured that the other six people on the plane were not honest about their weight. So he added 30 more pounds. <laughs> We're very thankful for that. <laughs> so Cam did what he does that did every night. He would basically tear himself down right before he got on stage. And before he got on the plane, he took that trusting leap of faith that all the great actors do. Cam would feel everything in performance, take everything to heart. He'd connect his heart to a live wire every night. On the road, he made a decision to love himself finally, to embrace honesty, to live off stage as he did on. And I think he's affected every single one of us in this room the same way. Thank you. of all of us, 
our aloha and our condolences um, and our deep gratitude to Keo's family, especially his beautiful father, Dwight, and his very beloved niece, Racine, and all of the ohanas. I want to thank them. Really, my gratitude is about letting the rest of us have Keo for a period of time. We are so, so, so grateful for that. I want to thank Michelle Aquino and Janu Cassidy for bringing him into their hula community. And, you know, they built this hula um, kind of, uh, you know, I, I, I said community, but really a, a, a hale where every week people of different ages, of different genders, of different abilities um, could all come and be introduced to hula and different skill levels. It was really quite remarkable. And I think ultimately what they were doing was community building. And if you could, you know, just imagine that what we're seeing tonight, what we're experiencing tonight, really was that ripple of the community that they created. So we're deeply, deeply indebted to Keo for that and to Michelle and Janu. I want to also thank my dear friend, Robert Casimero, Kumuhula, Robert Kazimara, and Nakamale, and my kum, Vicky Holt Takamine, for their love and their guidance in putting this together. Um, it has been very, very special and very important to a Nana Ike Kumu to look to the source. And thank you for lending us uh, one of Keo's kihei, this beautiful kihei that was printed by him with Hala. Um, his beautiful uh, lay that is on the table. And then one of um, the Kamale members, Norman Kainoa Kawai, lent us this beautiful um, Kahini Pa'alima. Uh, Norman, like Keo, came to New York to be an artist and joined the Alvin Ailey Company in the 1980s and still lives here and taught himself lay hulu. So it's kind of beautiful. This you know, from Hawaii, from Manhattan, kind of weaving together. Like many, many people here, I met Kale in hula class. And, you know, but when we met, we both had this thing of like a double take. We knew each other's names already, but we couldn't figure out why. And we decided to go out to dinner together, learn we were both theater people, and then learn that Nobuko Miyamoto, the very pioneering theater artist, and choreographer had introduced us long distance when uh, he was living in LA. And so I said to Keo, you know, I, I, I know we were meant to make something, but I, I'm not sure what it is. Um, as a theater director and you're an actor, I can only ask you, you know, do you have a one man show? Now this is New York. And so when you meet an actor, like they have one in their back pocket, you know. Um, but the director asks, right? It's just, and Keo, being Keo, said the most Keo thing, which he looked at me and he said, who would want to look at or listen to me in a one-man show? <laughs> I was like, well, do you notice like the magnet that you are in Hula? Like we, yes, you know, we're, we're mesmerized by you. And hearing his stories about, you know, here's, a, here's someone who played the king in The King and I and, and on the West End. Here's somebody who was in the, the most popular boy bands, Brown Skin in Hawaii. Um, you know, here's somebody who was also doing spoken word poetry, creating work with other theater artists. And here was somebody who was at an elite level of hula with Nakamale. So I just wanted to share with you tonight with some of his actor friends and his dear, dear friend, Cindy Chung, um, a little glimpse into kind of the process because Rachel Cooper, who spoke before, you know, she just took this kind of leap of faith. We said, Rachel, we don't have any money, um, but could you just give us some space? Um, and we'll, we went to the Asia Society and sat on your stage for, and for hours did improv and writing prompts. And Rachel had the uh, you know, presence of mind to actually videotape and transcribe our work. So after Keo passed, I went back to some of those transcriptions and looked at his words. And, you know, I had to do a 
broke into funny things like not just writing from, but write a list of 10 things that really piss you off. And now I'm gonna put a soapbox right there, I'm gonna get a stopwatch, and you have to go one through 10, two minutes on each topic. And you know, everybody's like, you're so nice, you're so nice. Well, you know, <laughs> we have a lot of fun with K1 the Soapbox. So we're gonna have Sweetie Chung and uh, Jasso Acevedo and Marina Salander and Dave Shelley, who not only being an amazing production manager, tour manager, but is also an amazing actor, do a reading from excerpts of Kao's writing in workshop. <laughs> and then that is going to be followed by, uh, we worked with two wonderful choreographers on Highland, his Kumuhula, Robert Casimero, and the spectacular hip-hop choreographer we were so honored to work with and travel with for two years, Rockefeller. So Rockefeller Street and Rockefeller Vermont will follow. But now, what do we call this? A Island outtakes, oh. Island outtakes. All your senses change. All your senses change. Hi, I'm Cindy Chung, and um, I met Keo in 2002 with um, Ed, my boyfriend at the time. And uh, I think we met him like the day after he moved to New York. And like <coughs> Billy said earlier, we just laughed so hard. That's all I remember for the two hours that we shared dinner together. And uh, we hit it off so quickly that a few months later when Ed and I were getting married, Keo was sitting at our table and had written a song for us and performed it at our wedding. So we fell in love really fast. <laughs> Hi, I'm Dacil Acevedo, and I met Kao um, through a mutual friend who brought me to Island. And I believe it was like the workshop, the whole, one of the first workshops of it. And it blew my mind, and it turns out he's my neighbor. I would see him at events and things, and we would uh, walk home together through New York City, and he sort of loved the city and sort of the way I did, and we would sort of marvel at everything together in the ditch, and you know, he was a block away, and I felt very safe uh, walking through New York City with him. And uh, he was just so easy. And I hadn't seen him in a long time, and like a couple of years ago, shooting a commercial somewhere in Atlanta and I was in a hotel room and it was like two in the morning and I had to get up really early and I couldn't sleep and I'm flipping channels and I'm like, Ugh, there he is, that's Kale. And on PBS they were playing his film, The Harmonic. And I just sat there and watched the whole thing and I was just in awe of it, like just mesmerized by him. And all the stuff I didn't get when I saw Island the first time, Seeing him in this like brotherhood with all these guys dancing together, I got it, and I was just in awe of him. Like I was like, I remember going to sleep with a big smile on my face and thinking of Kale and and being like, wow, I know that guy. That's my <laughs> friend. That's my friend Kale. I'm so lucky. I'm so proud that that's my friend Kale. Amazing. I'm Dave Shelley, and I was uh, Kale's production manager on Island. Um, and kind of what would happen when uh, Chris Cabell, myself, and Kale, we would tour the show, I go, uh, Kale, what do you want to do? He goes, let's go walk. I'm a little hungry. Yeah, of course. So then with the debate about where we're going to go eat, I said, Kale, I need some fish. He goes, Kale, this place, no, it's not so good. We go over here. So we go there. We have a nice dinner. And then it's dessert time. All right, so it's like, hey, does anybody get any dessert? And I'm like, okay, come on, I don't need any. He's like, no, 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 no. So we'd think about it, there'd be a debate about what kind, of, what kind of dessert, and he'd always go, he'd get some, and then I'm like, no, I'm good. He goes, Poppy, Poppy, come on, you gotta have a little, you gotta have a little. As you know, he was a dessert pusher all the time. <laughs> that man loved dessert. So when we were on tour in Houston, we went to a place called the House of Pies, which is basically a Denny's with like 36 different types of pies, like up in the little photos everywhere, the big uh, pie
pie counter that you would order from, uh, and it's like Texas. It is big. <laughs> so last weekend, uh, Saturday, I was doing a show in Houston, and I was by myself, and I said, you know what? I'm going to the house of pie. <laughs> <laughs> so 9 o'clock, by myself, at the counter, I'm like, give me the largest piece of chocolate cream pie you have for me and my friend Kao. <laughs> and I sat there. There's no way I could finish it. And uh, it just made me think about him and uh, how happy he was in so many small moments all the time. OK, that's not fair. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I can't follow <laughs> dessert. <laughs> <laughs> Michelle and Ale Aquina that we saw earlier, and, and Jenny Kaspi. And um, yeah, my, uh, when I close my eyes and I think of Tia, um, Kao, all of these sort of uh, flickers or, or glimmers of, of memory snippets, and, and um, definitely long lines and elongations and just majestic beauty um, that Eleanor also mentioned before just this extension that goes on forever. Um, another very uh, yummy memory is, of course, of Keo dancing at the um, uh, HCF Ohana holiday parties. <laughs> Has it heard anyone? <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and just you know, his, his smile, sort of like a little bit shy, but also a little bit and then he goes, shut up. So this is all your senses change. <laughs> Things change that drive me crazy. crazy. Traffic. Traffic here and in Hawaii. People driving so slow, like they're in a parade. Stupid people in stupid films. <laughs> when I'm late. The subway, when it's broken down. Especially the F train. <laughs> people who don't get in the train. People don't just stop inside the door, get in. And wear deodorant. <laughs> Ignorance about hula. Drunk tourists flapping their arms. Mm. Elitism. The religious right. Unapologetic waste. The price of cigarettes, even though I just quit. <laughs> Lack of compassion. Procrastination. Obligation. The Hummer. People who don't pick up after their dogs. Are if your, your dog, dog shits, shits, pick, pick it, it up, up, people. <laughs> Random things, things I wonder, wonder about. about. Why am I always so busy? Why does money rule our lives? People need to know exactly what you are. What difference does it make? Why am I always hungry? <laughs> Where does dust come from? <laughs> <laughs> Why is it only people without money give to homeless people on the subway like, hey brother, here's two dimes. <laughs> Why do I, I love New York? York? All the different kinds of food. The buildings, just amazing. Old buildings and new buildings. And super tall buildings, and they're all condensed into this one little place, and it forces everybody to interact. Central Park. Oh, it's an oasis. The museum. The, the theater. theater! Did I mention the food? The food, oh my god. The best movies. Weird movies you could never see anywhere else. The dogs. Oh. <laughs> all the different kind of dogs. They're just a beacon when you walk in. When you see a dog carefree in the city, your heart just melts. Pasta, pasta! Let's eat there after this. <laughs> the subway. I love being a local. Crossing town underground when everyone above is stuck at rush hour. <laughs> All the different kinds of people. Not like LA where everyone is an aspiring movie star. <laughs> Here, every different occupation is equally important. Artists, restaurateurs, drivers, 
trash collectors. The, the people here are real. What about the cold? I love the snow. I love getting bundled up wearing big coats. Last year it snowed on Thanksgiving and Christmas. The city was so quiet. The whole place deserted. I was out there making snowballs, playing snowball fights with my friends who live on the same island. In the middle of Broadway. Your whole sense of where you are, all your senses change. What, what is, is sacred, sacred spirituality, spirituality to, to you? The rhythm of the Ipu Heke. The voices of the Oli. The chicken skin side of the Olakatuhuka. The wind, the sky, and the sun. I was raised. I was born again at a black church in L.A. When they were singing and dancing, I was in tears. But it wasn't about Jesus Christ. I wasn't thinking about the Trinity. It was about being connected to the universe. When you're outside of yourself, your whole life is meaningless in the scope of the universe. Being connected to the larger picture my kumu, and his kumu, and her kumu, and so on, and on, and on, became that link, my genealogy. You want to know, know what, what else? else? I'm from a place where I always wanted to be. Though I never did, I'd like to. I still have dreams about. I'd leave because. If you saw through my eyes, you would notice. In high school, I was this star of a frog. This is a postcard, too. People mistake me for. Three things I know are true are. Three things I know are lies are. I knew when I was a man. The first time I felt truly free. I'm from a place where I, I knew I was a man. I always I wanted to be. To Three things I know I never did, I'd like, like to. Three things I know are true. I still I have dreams about it. People mistake me. I had to leave. This is a postcard, too. If you saw this through my eyes, you would notice. If you saw through my eyes, you would notice. Three things I know are true. So this is a postcard, too. Though I never did, I'd like to. People mistake me. Three things I know are true. I'm from a Three things I know are lies are. I knew I was a man when. The first time I felt truly free was. The first time I felt truly free was. The first time I felt truly free was.
day called I Land. I've worked in many productions, and it's simply touch and go. Show me what I have to do, here's your check, peace. <laughs> <laughs> and so I'm used to it. You just, you know, you just flow with it, but with Kale, it was different. He wanted to know where I was from, why I got into breakdance. Does it hurt? <laughs> and I just moved. <laughs> and so he was very special. I was touched. I didn't know anything about Buddha. And so I definitely embarrassed myself when I was like, is it like this? <laughs> <laughs> you guys do like, you know, the coconut and the fire. <laughs> and he laughed. He was so kind. And I was very wrong. And he was just so passionate about his culture that I realized we did have a common thread. I'm very passionate about hip hop culture, about the roots, the ancestors, how they manifested in this dance. And I saw that that is exactly the same way Kayla was. And a lot of times we would talk about what happened, what has happened here? How come we feel so cheap? How come I feel like hip hop can just be thrown away, disposed, cheap and done, and, and forgotten about? And talking to Kale made me feel like I will, I will help to keep this culture going because look at what Kale is doing. Look at how Kale is mobilizing so many people through love. And I'm, I'm a rough girl, you know. I'm, Roberta was there a couple of times when Kale was trying to teach me how to hula. <laughs> <laughs> and he was like, you're too rough, girl. <laughs> Then it was tapes <laughs> of um, the beautiful, beautiful culture and tradition of Hawaii. And I fell in love. And I, I knew that because he is doing what he's doing, I can't continue what I'm doing. And so I was very, very sad when I was told that he passed away. Because I almost felt robbed. But then I realized he gave me a big gift that I could carry forever. So I just wanted to offer my dance and let you all know that Kale lives on and he's here. Aloha, friends and family and friends again of our friend, Kale Wolford. Uh, my name is Robert Casanero and uh, you pretty much, some of you might know who I am. I met you while I was in New York, mostly with Kale, I think. Um, you know, when I think about Kale, several things come to mind. No meat, <laughs> no ice in the water. <laughs> Seems to be a very big part of his life. <laughs> um, like, like you, I miss him. Uh, I miss his kindness and his acceptance. I miss the lessons that he taught me and that I knew I could learn so much more from him. I want to thank you for remembering him. And I would like to encourage you to tell Kale's story. It's how we keep the ones we love alive so that they don't become so much myth as we have a tendency to do. We, we also have a tendency sometimes to make people we love bigger than, than, than life and uh, although he's much deserving of that. I think that the, the human and the very humble part of Kale would be just happy with the kind of stories we would all share about him. Um, so I have one story I'd like to share with all of you. After Kale had passed, I had talked with his friend Tracy Lalua. Sorry, I had talked with our friend Tracy Lalua who had told me that when she was with another friend of Kale's, she asked Kale to give her a sign that he was all right. And the next morning, out of the blue, on her carpet, she found uh, a feather, which she found was very unusual, because, you know, it's not like there were a lot of birds around or whatever. 
So then Tracy thought she'd try the same thing, and the next day she kind of like found a feather too. I, I didn't think I needed to do that because, you know, I just don't think kale is right here. And I'm sure some of you feel the same way. But it was Christmas time, and I had gone to my Christmas tree, and I had all these um, ornaments on it, and I looked at one particular ornament. Now, it wasn't that there weren't like duplicates of that ornament on the tree, but I looked at one in particular, and, and I kind of just vaguely thought in my mind, I'm not looking for any kind of proof. There's nothing that you need to do for me, but um, how's about, I mean, it'll be nice, you know, this little ornament on, um, you know, on the floor, like the feather. Nothing, every day, nothing. <laughs> the day after Christmas, I always clean up everything in my house that, that says Christmas. And I take the ornaments off, I take the tree off, a little um, ottoman that I had it sitting on, and I, I take off the, the glass top, and I lift the ottoman. And on the bottom of the honor, uh, ottoman, right in the middle, was that ornament. And um, will you give me a second? Here it is. And it was sitting in the middle of, of where I had taken the ottoman off. And I looked at it and I just started laughing because I, I thought, you son of a gun. That's not exactly what I said. <laughs> but you know, you get the idea. Making me work for this. And so I just, uh, I keep this guy close to me all the time because it makes me smile and it makes me think of kale and, and the different ways that we can teach each other lessons every day to be better, to be grateful, and to live in positive vibrations. Hello everyone, um, my name is Tristan. Uh, sorry I'm not prepared, I rushed here from my job. Um, <laughs> uh, I had a kind of a spiel written out, but uh, it seems like everyone's telling very beautiful stories about Kerry Wilfred. So even though I didn't know him very well, I want to share my story about K.O. Um, I actually saw Island when it came out here in New York. I had worked for an organization called Aperture, promoting HIV AIDS awareness in the Asian and Pacific Islander community. Uh, and I took this guy that I really liked <laughs> to see. Um, <laughs> He didn't know it was a date, though, but that's okay. <laughs> um, but, you know, I wanted to share that with everyone uh, because, you know, knew him well or not, uh, he, he did provide those connections for everyone. Um, and the song that we're going to do today is Aloha Aku Aloha Mai uh, that he had written with Kumu Ma Michael Lanakila Tapitan uh, after they had filmed that movie. Uh, and this song reminds me uh, in our homana that aloha is a powerful force uh, and that we should always remember.
So I wanted to share some clips with you of some of his stage and early film work. Um, we did a few shows together in the early 2000s, um, but peppered through that were some readings that we did. And um, if you don't know what readings are, it's usually something that you rehearse, you know, for an hour the day of, and you bring your script, and you make some decisions, and then you <laughs> sort of see how it goes. <laughs> um, so the first piece um, is from a, a short play called uh, Pigeon, Romeo, and Juliet. <laughs> um, and I just brought it because he's so charming in it. Um, and he does it with an actress named Tess Rillo. And the second piece is called Rain. And it was done at the Crane Theater, which is like right over there, um, in about 2003. And it's a spoof on like a steamy film noir kind of novel. And I play this um, like artistically and sexually frustrated painter and he's like the hot, hunky neighbor that comes over. <laughs> and um, in this scene, um, there's a tattoo on his arm and I say, oh, you know, I, I always wondered what that said. And he says, it's Chinese. And then I go over and I read it and I said, oh, rain. And he says, oh, you read Chinese. Um, except that right before we went on stage, we decided that we would write rain in English, but with like Chinese brushstrokes. <laughs> <laughs> and we just thought that was so funny. Um, so you'll see how we handled that. <laughs> and then the last piece um, is called Pete So, that's a Korean name. Um, <laughs> and uh, it's, it's based on a character that um, our friend Peter Kim came up with in the show Sides that we did about terrible auditions. <laughs> and, um, and, he, and he took that name and um, a little history on that. So Keo and myself and our friends Rodney To and Eileen Rivera, you know, we're all actors in 2004 and we wanted to see what it was like to try writing for the first time. And we talked about it a lot and then we decided, you know, okay, okay, it's time, we're, we're gonna do it. We're gonna form this group. So we called our group, It's Time. <laughs> and um, we met up regularly, and you know, it was really safe space because none of us were writers. We're just actors, you know, responding to prompts. And we got to the point where we were brave enough to each write a short film and then film it. <laughs> and we didn't know what we were doing at all. Um, and we didn't, there were no cell phone cameras, so we had something mounted on a tripod. Um, so this uh, section is from the film that Keo wrote called Pizza, and uh, uh, he plays Pete, and he happens to deliver pizza instead of be an investment banker that he pretended he was to this guy he was dating. Um, and at the very end, there's a group scene, and you'll see that um, he comes in a few seconds later, and that's because he had to turn on the camera. <laughs> <laughs> like, all the pieces had that, like three people on the sofa strolled <laughs> Clearly, Ko's choice, and um, I think this might be um, possibly one of his earliest forays into filmmaking in 2004. So there's a snippet of pizza. <laughs> Enjoy. <laughs>
Can you live with your mom? She's like, I gotta go. Uh, the pizza's done and yeah, I'm sorry. Wait. Uh, <laughs> we're trying to shoot. <laughs> So uh, this is why I never see you at night. This is why we always argue. I feel like I need a job. Friends were good. What kind of shallow person do you think I was? I didn't think you were shallow. I just didn't think I was good enough for you. Well, you're not. But that doesn't mean I don't want to go out with you. <laughs> Thank you. 
to resurrect it today because it is such a beautiful song and it was meaningful to Kao and it helps us remember how beautiful his Armenian was. Yeah. Yeah. I was not going to bring that up because that's going to pressure us so much but she did so anyway. <laughs> Bear with us but um, I just want to say that Kao uh, took care of us. We were such a full of baby we didn't know what is Kao. It's like, Kao? What? Kao? What? <laughs> but uh, his Kao was uh, beautiful, and I see so many his Halamana here, like us, like me and Zala. He was the first, very first Kula teacher. Do you remember that Kao choo choo train? Like, <laughs> we go like this, and uh, he keeps going. <laughs> Not ours, but. 10, 20 minutes, <laughs> and he just keeps encouraging us, how, hey, have fun. And then I see some, my Hula sister goes like this because his cow was so good. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember one of my Hula sisters, she was now Japanese, who couldn't breathe. <laughs> so she started like, hell, I don't think I'm breathing. <laughs> I mean, he was doing cow, and then he was like, Thank you, Dara. Oh, gosh. But you are breathing. <laughs> and he was doing cow, otherwise, you would be on the floor. <laughs> so she was like really happy on the way back to subway station. Such a, I can do cow. <laughs> Not like kale, but close. So we would dedicate this song. 
sweet kale. This is a soul kale. Fun loving, easy going, carefree, open, and sometime in the same Hawaii grown celebration today. Okay, baggy jeans in kale. A kale in baggy jeans, that's imagine <laughs> not that's what baggy jeans. Sitting on the dark side bay. Aloha. Aloha. Ikea 
never say that word enough, right? Oh. Um, when I met Kao, I knew of him first through the theater community. And I knew that he was teaching some classes and I was just starting to get interested in hula. And I remember asking some of my friends in the hula community, so who is this Kao guy anyway? Is it good to take from him? And everybody said, oh, if you're gonna, if you're gonna study with Kao, you're studying with the best. And I love that. I didn't get the chance to study with him. Um, our paths moved in different directions, but I got to play music for him and hang out with him. And um, it's an honor to be here tonight at the celebration of his life. We've come to the last song of the night. It's called Pua Ahihi. And it's this beautiful mele aloha, this beautiful love song in hula that was written by Mary Kabenafukui and Maddie Lamb. And it's a very special song because it's part of a lineage of hula, the Maiki Ayu Lake lineage of hula. It's a signature song for that style. And that's a style of hula that Keo was a part of, will forever be a part of. And so many of the dancers that you see here tonight have learned in that style as well. Keo is a unifier, and tonight you're seeing people dressed in all different kinds of, of hula finery because they represent different groups maybe right now. But one time, everybody danced together. And Keo brought us all together. And Keo brought us all back together tonight, making one ohana, one family. The song Pua Ahihi talks about a beloved. And it, talks, it compares one's beloved to the ahihi flower that sits high atop Lanihuli and Nuhuanu on the island of Oahu. And it could be a beloved in a romantic sense. But tonight, we compare the ahihi flower to our beloved friend, our beloved Keo. And um, interestingly, the name ahihi, in Olelo Hawaii, in Hawaii, in the Hawaiian language, hihi means to entangle, to entwine, to mesh together. And if you look at everybody that was here tonight, everybody who's spoken, everybody who's danced, Kao has touched every one of their lives and has brought us all together, tangled together, and stitched and woven throughout all of us now is this beautiful tapestry. So while he may not be here in body, he's with us all because we are enmeshed with him. We are he to him. So um, we offer you tonight, as a closing number, Pua Ahihi, and I'd like to introduce my sister Patty. Aloha. Aloha. Aloha New York City. Aloha Hawaii. Aloha especially to Keo Johanna, his father's wife, sister Wendy, brother Brian, his dearly beloved Liz Dayton and her family. Aloha Kumu Robert and his Halau Hula brothers. Aloha to everyone watching around the world. It's all about love tonight, yes? Yeah. Kale's favorite phrase was positive vibrations. As you said before. Thinking about that phrase, I think he was asking us to join him in the ripple effect a vibration produces, ever expanding outward to infinity, immersing oneself with only the most positive, purest, loftiest thoughts and actions. But I think Kayo also wanted each of us to become our own positive vibration, to create a positive ripple effect by being filled with the Aloha spirit and then sharing that God love with others that we meet. We all loved being in Kale's presence. It was fun, uplifting, and joyful, even in the most serious circumstances. Kale taught us hula students to dance and let the energy flow from our fingertips to stand tall, expand, and smile. But what he really taught us was a love and respect for Hawaii, for people, and for culture. Through his hula lineage of Auntie Mahi Ayu Lake, who believes hula is life, K 
Caitlin Michelle transported us to a beautiful, peaceful world and taught us to tell our stories through dance. But most importantly, to do so with kindness, humility, and love for our little brothers and sisters. Auntie Mikey had deep faith, and so did Kayla, respecting and caring for all living things, just as the ancient Hawaiians did. Kayla's spiritual journey was a reflection of his desire to be the Aloha spirit that one would see when you were in his presence. He made each of us feel special and loved. He touched the hearts of people all around the world, in Hawaii, in New York, London, LA, the Philippines, including this girl from Catasauqua, Pennsylvania. <laughs> my husband says, my husband Kevin says, there are two kinds of people in the world, those that help and those that hinder. <laughs> Kao was a helper. He never refused a request. He was always ready to listen and lend a hand. He supported our dreams, and he encouraged and helped us all to soar. Many of us now see Kao in a rainbow in the heavens or when the shining star is dark at night. My image of Kao is of a bird mostly on the move, never still for too long, but sharing his beauty and his song along his way. Every morning, blue jays, cardinals, and sparrows greet me outside my living room window. Their song says, good morning, my dear Patty, just as Kayo was, and I can hear his voice. May we all see Kao in some form of beauty that we encounter every day. And we see his aloha spirit. And may we choose to be the reflection of Kao's spirit. Oh, we know, I come in. Gentle. Loving one day. You are missed, but will never be forgotten. Aloha A. Mahalo Keapu. The prayer is on its way.
Dessert. 